Okay, let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get started. Our Lord, thank you so much uh, just for this morning. Um, thank you for the snow. And, uh, and thank you, Father, for uh, the beauty it brings. I pray, God, that this would be um, instructive um, and productive and that uh, you would be glorified overall as we seek to understand your word and your truth uh, from your text. We thank you so much. For it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, we'll go and uh, review from last week, and then uh, we'll continue on with our discourse in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Uh, so um, in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7, verses uh, 1 to 8, um, Kohalath is uh, continuing to unpack essentially wisdom and foolishness, um, what wisdom is and what foolishness is. And he concluded that this thought to the congregation of Israel that humanity goes through highs and goes through lows um, in this particular text. Um, he starts off in, uh, in verse 10, or uh, verse 9, really. Um, don't be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these days? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about this. Right. We talked about that particular uh, that particular uh, point there, that when someone says that question, they're not really looking for an answer. Right. Is there perception um, that ought to be examined? Um, additionally, no one knows why they go through these periods personally. We know um, collectively what the future of uh, what the future is um, um, as saints. Right. But we don't know what our everyday life is going to look like five years from now. 10 years from now, things like that. There is uh, uh, much fluctuation, much change that comes about from uh, year to year. So we don't know where we're going to be uh, five, or, five or 10 years from now, although we do uh, search that out from time to time. The one constant in reality really is the wisdom of God. And that is the thing that remains constant, that even though our life may fluctuate, um, there might be highs and lows. The thing that grounds us, that keeps us in proper focus is his wisdom. Again, uh, keeping this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, this theme in mind for this chapter, again, this is one of the most interesting chapters in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, it is a distinction between the foolish person and the wise person. Right. Um, we've been looking at this. It's really proverbial in terms of the way that it is written. Um, and it follows this kind of this thought. This is the only uh, structure where this where this book is written is in chapter seven. This this kind of proverbial couplets of wisdom out, outlined and underscored here. Kowaleth in this chapter makes a distinction between the foolish person and the wise person and how each one thinks and how they respond by what and how and what they think. In the context of chapter 7, we have wise men and foolish men. Now, again, we have to underscore this. is uh, This isn't like Aesop's fables wisdom. Wise men in the context of, bibli of the biblical perspective is one who makes choices with the consideration and thought of God's word, which is known as wisdom. Um, uh, Kohalath or Solomon writes that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a, an idiom for God's word. Okay? They are intentional about the decisions that they make, and they are intentional in using God's wisdom to make said decisions. In the context of uh, foolish men from the biblical text, it is the context that one makes choices without the consideration of God's word. Everyone makes choices. It's the source of authority by which these choices are made. They do not consider or reject, or they do not consider or they flat out reject God's wisdom and how to live. They are unintentional. So even though individuals make good decisions, the motivations for why they make them could also be foolish. Okay. So let's continue here. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 15, we will continue on from verse 14. I will read verse 14 just to keep in context here. So in the day of goodness, be good, or in the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, inspect or consider that God has produced uh, one as well as the other so that uh, man or humanity will not discover anything that will be after him. Okay. Verse 15, I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Let's take a look at the words in red here, uh, righteous and righteousness. We will look at righteous first. Sadiq is the Hebrew word here. This word appears 206 times in the Hebrew text, and it appears eight times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, when we come to the word righteous, we have to be careful um, um, because uh, the, this certain word has a different understanding depending on the context the word appears in. We cannot just broad brush this. We have to look at uh, uh, the context to determine uh, what type of, uh, what righteousness is this talking about, okay? Usually when we read this, we might be considering righteousness in terms of the position that we have in God because of Christ. But in terms of the Hebrew text, it's used in various different ways. For example, this word is used of God concerning his nature. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, you don't have to turn there. I have it up on the screen. You can mark it down if you'd like. Moses uh, says this, he goes, the rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. The characteristic and quality of God is that he is righteous. He is righteous in and of himself as well as faithful and, uh, and just, right, and upright. The word of God is also used concerning the law of God, which makes sense because if uh, the righteousness of God is, uh, is, or the righteousness is found in the source of God, well, then what he gives is also righteous as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 8, Moses calls the whole law righteous concerning how the nation of Israel was to God and direct themselves. It says, or what great nation is there? that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law, which I'm setting before you today. Again, this underscores the uniqueness of the nation of Israel, that all nations have had their laws given by men, but God is the source of their law, which makes them unique, i.e. righteous in terms of the law and how it's understood. This word is also used as a judicial term for the nation of Israel. Um, judges were to judge righteously. Okay? And they were to uh, uh, declare individuals righteous who had not done anything law wrong as according to as far as the law was concerned. In Deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 1 and 2, if there is a dispute between men and they go to court, and the judges decide their case, they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Then it shall, excuse, excuse me, then it shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall then make him lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of the stripes according to his guilt, right? So the judges are there to distinguish or determine which one is righteous and which one is wicked when a case or a dispute is brought between them. And of course, the one who is judged to be guilty is the one who is punished for it. In Genesis chapter seven, verse one, this term is also used as a positional term in the sight of God as well. This term is used in Genesis chapter seven, verse one, concerning Noah. It says, then the Lord said to Noah, enter into the ark, you and your household, for you alone I have seen 
to be righteous before me. This is, the, this is also a term that is used to describe one's position in the sight of God. Okay? And lastly, the term righteous is also used to describe a person's activity aligned either with the law of Moses or the created order among humanity. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, or I'm sorry, 24, verses 16 to 17, concerning Saul and David. Okay? When David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my, my, my son David? Then Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Saul, uh, uh, David could have killed Saul, and instead he did not. He did not. He chose to display mercy to him. And he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have dwelt, dwelt well with me while I have dealt wickedly with you. In an attempt to try to kill David, um, David uh, does not seek vengeance against Saul. And as a result, this is Saul's speech, right? That he is more righteous in terms of his actions than David, okay? So a, a general comment concerning righteous, what does this mean? Well, I don't think this is talking about God's the, the one's position in the sight of God or anything like that. In the general context of this passage concerning Sadiq or righteous, as it's translated, is this is discussing a person's activity among human beings. Kohalath has seen that there's righteousness, that, 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 that since Kohalath is writing and observing this time for Israel, their righteous acts were to be guided by the law of Moses as a nation, right? No idolatry, no violence, no wickedness. This, in essence, made them righteous among one another. Other nations were to observe them as an example to respond to one another, right? This is what he means here. That there is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. Now let's look at righteousness here, this word. This word is similar to Sadiq. It is Sadak. It appears 119 times in the Hebrew scriptures. This word appears three times in the book of Ecclesiastes, and it is often contrasted with wicked acts and activity, okay? So whenever you see this word, righteousness, it is often contrasted with wickedness. For example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 16, just a couple of pages over, we see this word, sadek, here. Furthermore, I have seen or I've observed, I've inspected under the sun that in the place of justice, there is wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, there is wickedness, right? Solomon making this example or Solomon making this observation and seeing wickedness and righteousness in the same space. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8, Sadiq is, or Sadak is used as well. He says, if you see the oppression or see oppression of the poor and the denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official and there are higher officials over them. Remember, we discussed this at length, right? that the reason why people make decisions like these is they have people over them. This is one of the reasons why the denial of justice and righteousness exists is because there are people over them that command them to do the things that they do. What is the main point here in this text? That um, he has seen everything during his lifetime of temporalness or futility that there's a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs in his wickedness. 
Kovalev seems to observe that those who live well and have their lives aligned with reality in terms of their actions and activity seem to live shorter lives than those who are wicked. Ain't that the truth, right? A dictator seems to live longer than a benevolent person, right? That those who continue in their wickedness seem to live longer than those who don't. That a person's righteous activities and their acts that they do and the motivations for why they do them, they seem to get the short end of the stick in terms of their life, their physical life here under the sun. That doesn't seem like a good deal, right? Again, Koalath making an honest observation, a sobering one, that it doesn't seem that even though a person lives well, their life may not be preserved here versus those who seem to make all of the wrong decisions and they seem to live forever according to this perspective that Kohaleth is underscoring here. Then Kohaleth gets really weird. In verse 16, he says the following. Now, I, I will read it from my scripture, but I, I, I retranslated it here for the purposes of our discourse. It says, do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Huh? Wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to be righteous and wise. Don't be overly right, righteous and wise? I retranslated it because of the way that this is, uh, way that this is read. I, I'll go ahead and, uh, and put it up on the screen and then we'll talk about it. It says, you, I, I translated, you ought, not, you ought not to be excessively righteous and you ought not to be overly wise. Why should you cause yourself ruin? That is how I've retranslated this text. And the reason why I put it in brackets, you ought not, is because this is the Joseph type okay, in Hebrew. Now, what is the Joseph type? Let's review this. Okay. The Joseph type, remember, this emphasizes indirect commands that another person is giving to another. So this is not direct to an individual. This is a general uh, command that's given to, to the population. Okay? And also, too, the justice does not carry a, uh, uh, the full weight of a command or, or of an imperative. Um, for instance, like he or she must do this. If I tell my daughter, please. I need you to take out the trash. That would be an imperative. Okay? But it is stronger than a suggestive. Um, you could do this if you want, but you know, don't no problem, no rush. So it's it's right in the middle, it's right in the center here. I would say that the Joseph underscores you ought to do this. You could do it, but you could not do it, right? The Hebrew does not use imperative forms to express the negative. So instead, it will use the second person form and will have the negative particle all. Okay? In this in this statement, it follows this structure. Okay? So just for your uh amusement here, here is the all. Oh, this is not on. Is this on? It is on, but it's not showing up on the screen. Yeah, it is. Yeah, here is the all right here. Here is the second person plural in both those texts, and here is the conjunction uh, um, here on the screen. So you ought to, you ought not to be excessively righteous, okay? And you ought not to be overly wise. Now, let's take a look at a couple of words here. Let's take a look at excessively. Rabbah is the word for excessively here. Okay. This Hebrew word that is excessively occurs 235 times in the Hebrew text, 19 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, 
Okay, this word is a verb. Okay, however, the form of the word in this context is adverbial. Okay, so it is used in terms of the word that's used uh, right next to it. It is a righteous, it's used of righteousness. So don't be overly or excessively. Um, this stem of the word is the hephil, which is the action of the qual. So in terms of a person is being righteous, but they're being overly righteous. Okay. Interesting. The word overly is the word yoter. Eight times in the Hebrew scriptures it occurs. Its most frequent usage is in this book. Okay. Seven times in the book of Ecclesiastes. This word functions again as another adverb within this text, again, due to the structure and nature of the sentence. So a person is, can be excessively righteous and overly wise or, or, or excessively wise, abundantly wise, and Koholeth is warning that a person ought not to be this way. Then he gives an inter a question, an interrogative question for one to ponder. So why should you cause yourself ruin? Samem is the Hebrew word here for cause yourself ruin. This word occurs 86 times in the Hebrew scriptures, one time here. This is the only time that it is used. Okay. This word is kind of fascinating in terms of how it is structured. This word is in the hip -tabel. It is reflexive, okay? which is yourself, and it is imperfect, the yiktal, which means this is talking about one's position, one's attitude, that they're going to ruin themselves right, in terms of what they're doing and how they're functioning. So what is the main point of this statement? Again, fascinating the way that Koheleth writes this. Have you ever met a person who's too good for themselves? It's like God had said, let there be light, and he turned to them and asked them, what do you think? Right? Koheleth mentioned that a person may have the right activity or the right positions, but due to their excessive righteousness, they will cause themselves to be ruined. This is an individual who may look to their actions and believe that that is what makes them oh so holy. That the sun doesn't rise until they wake up type deal. Because of this, they, may, they are going to ruin themselves as a result of their activity and their perspective of their activity. This is very important, according to Kohaleth, not to be overly righteous. Right? But on the other hand, he writes another strange sentence in verse 17. This is interesting. Same structure as verse 16. You ought not be excessively wicked, and you ought not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? So it's not good to be overly righteous because you will ruin yourself. Right. At the same time, you ought not to be excessively wicked. I kind of think of the overly righteous individuals, Westboro Baptist Church, those type of individuals. Right. They have the right position concerning uh, homosexuality, but they 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 over they're overboard. They overcook it. Right. Their techniques are awful, and the way that they engage individuals are awful. Right? Therefore, they ruin themselves. 
Now, those who are excessively wicked and ought not to be a fool, why should you die before your time? This is easy. The main point of this statement is Kohaleth parallels this statement with the previous one. Okay? Those who act wickedly in an excessive manner or who act in a foolish manner may purposely shorten their physical life before their time. Those individuals who, uh, who are overtaken by their own wickedness and their own foolishness may shorten their lifespan. Okay? Man, so you can't be overly righteous, otherwise you'll ruin yourself or you'll destroy yourself, really. And you can't be overly foolish, yet you'll shorten your lifespan. So what is what is the remedy? How do we uh, how should we ought to live? Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse 18 is the answer to this question. Verse 18. It is good that you, um, it is good that you grasp one thing and also ought not let to go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. I retranslated this. It says, as, as, um, let me go ahead and read my translation and then we'll talk about it. It is qualitatively good that you grasp this and also not ought to let go of that. For the one who fears God comes forth with all or with both. Now, what is Koholeth getting at at this statement here? I don't think that he's talking about uh, grasping and not let, letting go of wickedness. That's not what he's talking about here and uh, uh, grasping forth with righteousness. That's not what he's talking about here. This is an, an idiom. A statement of fact. Okay. Think of yourself like kind of on the handlebars. You know what I'm saying? If you're grasping with with one, right, and not letting and and you you know you don't have a, a grasp of the other, and then if you like grasp this and let go of this, you're out of balance, right? If you keep doing this, right. In other words, it's qualitatively good to grasp both. And he gives us the qualities of grasping both of them. How do you do that? You do that by fearing God. Really, Koholeth is getting at is the concept of balance. Balance. Just like uh, the great prophet uh, Pat Morita in the Karate Kid. Balance is key. Kohalev's statement really is a general statement concerning that one not, ought not to live in extremes. That's really what this is. To be overly righteous is to ruin yourself, but to be overly wicked is to ruin yourself too. Okay. Swinging pendulums from both ways is foolish. Okay. Notice, though, where the balance comes from. It doesn't come from our own minds. Okay. It doesn't come from our own source. The balance in a person's life comes only from the perspective of fearing God. Whoa. If you're looking for balance in your life, if one continues to make boneheaded, dumb decisions, they're swinging the pendulum and being excessively wicked, then they need God's wisdom to balance themselves and their activity and their motivations and their outlook. Consequently, if one is excessively righteous as well, more than likely, they are seeing God's word improperly, and they need God's word to balance themselves as well. Now, this isn't the first time that Kohaleth has brought this up, okay? 
this is again we're just kind of re- we're doing the time warp again we're just re-racking points that's all we're doing here in ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses uh, uh chapter chapter 12 verse chapter 3 i'm sorry verses 12 to 14 Kohalath already gives this, uh, gives us this wisdom. It's, it's, again, it's not anything new. He writes, I know that there's nothing better for them to rejoice and do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks and sees good in all of his labor, it is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will remain forever. That there's nothing to add to it and there's nothing to take from it. For God has worked so that men should fear him. That's the whole point, that, that, that men should acknowledge him and should acknowledge his wisdom and what he has given to humanity. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 6 to 7, he says the same thing. Do not let your speech cause you to sin. And do not say in the presence of the messenger, this is talking about them going to the temple to make a vow, that when you make it, uh, be quick in doing it and completing it. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams, there are many words, there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. The motivation for going to the temple and offering a vow was to acknowledge him. And that should be the intent as well and motivate one's activity. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, <clears throat> which we are approaching here, will be in the next couple weeks. It says, although a sinner does a hundred times and may lengthen his life. Hey, doesn't that sound familiar? We just talked about that in chapter seven. Still, I know that it'll be well for those who fear God. So even though a a sinner, a wicked person in the sight of God may may live a hundred times and lengthen his life, Kohaleth writes that it still is better for those. It will go well for those who fear God and fear him openly, but it will not be well for the evil man. And he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. It may look like he may have longevity in this life, but in comparison to the perspective of God, This is all he's got, essentially. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, again, last, even the last, one of the last statements of this book here, the conclusion, when all has been heard is fear God and keep his ordinances, because this applies to every person. Again, fearing God is the key to balance. True balance, not yoga, okay? Although yoga is nice, all right? It's good. Stretches your body, gets your limbs, you know, all flexible and everything. But that's not it. Balance comes from knowing God, from knowing his word. Now, Kohaleth transitions to talk about the quality of wisdom and why it's important for balance. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 19, Kohaleth writes the following. Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than 10 rulers in a ci- who are in a city. Fantastic statement. What is Kohaleth's conclusion regarding wisdom and how wisdom benefits the one who is wise? Koalath transitions in this chapter and brought up the advantage of the quality of wisdom that a wise man possesses, more than 10 rulers. That's amazing because rulers have influence. They have great influence, right? Huge influence. However, influence doesn't guarantee wisdom. That is super. Just because one is a ruler, that doesn't mean that they have wisdom. Wisdom has greater influence qualitatively than 10 rulers in a city. Fantastic. So if that's the case, 
Why would anyone, according to Koaleth, go anywhere else to find balance? Continuing, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. This is an interesting statement here that Koheleth makes. He says, indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and who never sins. Wow. Wow. What is what is he getting at here? Should we just then should we just throw caution to the wind? Well, he already he has already talked about this in the previous text. So he's not talking about living wickedly for the sake of wickedness. What is he saying here? Indeed, he wants us to focus by using this word here. Indeed, focus, pay attention. That there's not a righteous person on earth. Koheleth, as usual, drops truth bombs throughout this book. And this one is a megaton one. Koheleth mentions that there's not one person who lives and thinks aligned with reality, and does not sin. This statement really, in one sense, ought to be a comfort. Remember I told you that, that reading the Ecclesiastes should not be a drudge. You know what I'm saying? This is meant to inform us about certain things, to give us wisdom in how to live. This should be a comfort to us. Why should it be a comfort to us? Because this is why a righteous person ought to fear him and thus have true balance in their outlook. This is why one needs wisdom as this becomes the guardrail. Wisdom is the guardrail to live balanced. By the way, this this is underscored this statement that Koheleth makes is not isolated in the book of Ecclesiastes. We find it all over scripture, Hebrew scriptures and Greek scriptures, by the way. In Psalm 130, verse 3, he talks about this. It says, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Again, underscoring that if you were to keep tallies on this, who could stand and say that they don't have this? In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, concerning Solomon's prayer for the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem, he says this, when they sin against you, that is the nation of Israel, when they sin against you, and then, he wrote, and then he quotes, for there is no man who does not sin. And you are angry with them and deliver them to an enemy so that they take them away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near. Solomon recognizes that there is not a man on the face of the earth, no matter what nation they come through, that does not sin. And even in the book of Proverbs, Kohalath writes the following. Who can say that I have cleansed my heart and I'm pure from my sin? Who could say that? No one could say that, right? So again, how is this an encouragement that, that Kohalath writes this? Well, again, the term here, the key term that has been used today is balance. And how God's word and fearing God brings that to us. For instance, wisdom that is fearing God informs a wise person of the source of active sin. If we want to know why it is that we do the things that we do sometimes and why we have the struggles that we have, well, then we look to God's word. Paul did the same thing in Romans 7. Amen. Okay? He understood that it wasn't necessarily him in terms of his inner man that was doing this, but it was the nature of his body, the source of the sin that was causing him to covet. 
Wisdom that is fearing God informs a wise person of the outcome of active sin. Now, I find this to be very fascinating because, again, wisdom, along, Ecclesiastes, along with Proverbs, makes this distinction. You make dumb choices, you get dumb outcomes, right? Don't, if you want good, better outcomes, or at least potentially better outcomes, well, then live in wisdom. We see this also, too, in Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel. You know the good you ought to do. Sin is crouching at your door and his desire is to have you, but you must master it. Make good choices. Wisdom that is fearing God informs a wise person of why they, not, that why they ought not to engage or give themselves over to active sin. It's, it's one thing to not give yourself over to active sin because you want to please God. It's another, uh, add on to that, because we don't want dumb outcomes. That's also on the table as well. It's not just for the fact of pleasing God to be rewarded in the future. That is one thing. But it's also, too, because we want to live our lives well here. Life already gives a lot of drama. Why are we adding to this? By making stupid choices, right? Four, four, wisdom that is fearing God informs a wise person of the proper motivation of how to conduct themselves in a truly righteous manner. If you know the state of who you, if you know the state of your nature and you, and God has given the wisdom to avoid that, wouldn't you want to take that? That makes sense. Wisdom that is fearing God informs a wise person how to perceive the day of goodness in life and the day of prosperity or in the day of goodness be good. But it also informs a wise person of how to perceive the day of adversity also. Wisdom gives balance. According to Koaleth, this is the sum up here, it is fearing God, which comes from knowing wisdom, is what brings true balance in a believer's life. It gives the proper source and the perspective of a person's righteous activities in the sight of mankind, so one will not be overly righteous. And it gives the believer the source and the motivation not to continue in participating in active sinful activities. That is the point here in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 8 or 8 to 14. I'm sorry, 14 to um 14 to 20 or 15 to 20. Okay. Um we will continue our discourse into Ecclesiastes chapter 7 uh, next week. Let's uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that a lot of people are seeking balance, individuals making decisions, goofy decisions, and they don't know the source of why they make it, or they look for alternative sources. Other people um, being overly righteous <clears throat> and believing that that gets them brownie points with you as a result of it. Lord, we need your word your word to give us balance in both areas so that when we engage in sinful activity, that we know what to do, where to go to get out of it and why it is important that we don't remain there. <clears throat> and when we are overly righteous to, to, be, uh, to get refocused, to put ourselves in proper light, to understand that really our righteousness and our goodness comes from what you have given to us. You're the source of all of it. Thank you again, Lord, for giving us true balance in your word. We thank you so much for it's in your son's name.